You guys, did you see the season four announcement for Bridgerton the other day? I swear I wasn't even that excited for the announcement because it was just a replay of everything until the moment at the end when they handed Benedict his suit for the masquerade ball. Oh, I'm so ready for it. You know, it wasn't even until part two of season three that I even properly learned Benedict's name. Before that, I always used to just call him the other Bridgerton brother. I did want to talk about Ben though, and maybe we can try and guess what they're going to do with him on the show. I did rewatch season one of Bridgerton and I'm going to add some thoughts about that and some other characters as well. It's not just going to be about Benedict. Anyway. Onto the video. If you're not familiar with Benedict's story from the books, he and Colin are the last two eligible Bridgerton brothers for the season because Gregory's 14 and so he's still too young. At the family's masquerade ball, Benedict meets a woman and he's immediately intrigued. She has three other men showering her with compliments and Ben cuts in and he tells them that she's promised him a dance. He escorts her to the private terrace where they immediately hit it off. They joke, they laugh, they dance and they also kiss. All this while he's trying to figure out who she is but she won't say. So he collects these little clues and things that she says, the way that she acts. I actually really liked it when he was looking for clues and he's kind of observant, like he will notice little details in the way that she phrases certain answers. But because she's also rather reluctant to answer anything, he learns a lot by the questions that she asks him. Sadly though, the clock strikes 12 midnight and Ben's mystery Cinderella woman has to rush home, leaving him only with her glove and the memory of the most romantic night that he's had. He searches for her, but two years pass by before he finds her again, unbeknownst to him at first. Obviously, they end up crossing paths again by complete coincidence, and he doesn't recognize her. She does recognize him. Her name is Sophie, and she's the illegitimate daughter of an earl who, due to mistreatment by her stepmother, ends up working as a maid. Their story, Ben and Sophie's, it actually starts properly together when she has to nurse him back to health from a fever and she becomes a kind of lady in waiting in the Bridgerton house for a time. I'm really oversimplifying it, but this story is a Cinderella kind of upstairs downstairs romance. Sure, Sophie is the daughter of an earl, but she's still illegitimate. So the Tom would rather still look down on her. I will say that I didn't really enjoy the Cinderella part the most, only because it bordered a bit on insta-love and they could have had a connection, sure, but the love at first sight and trying to find her using the glove, Eh. I did thoroughly enjoy them getting to know each other at his country home though. And Sophie is so kind and gracious that everybody just loves her. Even the Bridgertons eventually bring her into the fold before they really know who she is. She is quite charming. Somebody commented that Michaela, the actress who plays Michaela, would make a great Sophie. And I agree. I mean, she's stunning and she's so charismatic. I also didn't know that she's South African. So that's a nice extra. I love that for us and for her. There wasn't much about Benedict that really stood out to me, except that he is a proper gentleman. A bit of a mama's boy as well, but in the best way, as he dances with some of the girls who also don't get that much attention at the balls, the wallflowers. He also says he doesn't mind dancing with the wallflowers, and these are not pity dancers, he's just nice, and he says that he likes dancing with the wallflowers, because sometimes the popular girls can be a little shallow. So there's this moment when he takes Sophie to the house, telling her that he'll ask his mother to find Sophie a job, and when Sophie's like, well, what if there aren't any openings? Ben answers, she loves me, she'll make an opening. And I don't really remember this relationship with Violet with any one of the other Bridgerton boys, so I found it really special. And he also initially enlists his mom's help with finding Sophie by using the glove that she left at the ball because it has initials embroidered on it and such. So like almost all of Julia Quinn's heroes up until this point, her main characters have this trademark banter and she's so good at writing characters, enjoying each other's humor. What the showmakers missed in Penn and Collins on screen romance is also just showing how much they joked with each other, how much they enjoyed each other. They, in the show, made Penn too anxious to please and, you know, they stripped that side of her. Though we do see it a little bit in season one with her and Colin joking with each other. In season three, they had her have this dynamic with Debling, which made it seem as though she had more chemistry with Debling. And now that I think about it, maybe they should have just done without Debling and shown us more of this dynamic between Colin and Penn that they had a little bit in season one. Also, I've always known the actress who plays Penn to be a really good actress, but Colin in season three made me forget that he's actually a really good actor. In season one, he was completely different. He shows a bit more range in his role. They have him sing. I'd forgotten about that. And I really liked him. So I'm guessing it's just a letdown of writing and direction for season three. Anyway, speaking of Colin, he's still single in Ben's story. And he sees that Ben is hopelessly in love with Sophie. And he's quite moody because he can't be with her. But Ben hasn't announced this to anybody, actually. It's just obvious to everybody in the household. So Colin goes, oh, for goodness sake, just do us all a favor and marry her already. 
Anyway, I can't talk about the book without talking about my favorite scene, which is when Benedict washes Sophie's hair and he bathes her. And when she's all shy getting out of the tub, he holds up a towel and he goes, I'll have you wrapped up before I can see anything. And he politely averts his gaze. You know, the way that he wanted to look after her and bathe her was so sweet. It made me think of Michael and Franny when they were being intimate. And Michael is the one who notices that she's supposed to be on her period at the time, but she isn't, meaning, you know, she's pregnant. I don't know. I think a Regency man noticing that kind of thing ahead of his own physical needs in the moment, I loved it. I do think though that Julia Quinn's protagonists, the male protagonists, tend to be just conservative enough to fit into that time period and it feels true to it in the novels, but also slightly progressive in a way that feels relatable, right? They marry for love and they're generally a lot kinder and more accepting than everybody else in the ton. And to be fair, this is not just limited to the male characters. Anyway, we haven't seen a romantic side to Ben on the show yet. He's just the adorable, funny middle brother. On the show, not in the book, Benedict did strike up a friendship with a painter named Henry who invited him to his studio and his sexy parties. At one such party, Ben walks in on Henry having sex with another man. Adding to that bit of scandal, which eventually turns out not to be such a scandal, Henry is married, but he later tells Ben that he and his wife have an arrangement that works for them. They're happy because he can't be openly out, but he is in love with his man lover. He tells Ben what it feels like to not be able to openly laugh with him and be with him or dance with him. He talks about the courage of living outside of expectations of society. And this makes Ben more comfortable and bold in his attraction to Madame Delacroix. It's not like he was ashamed or anything. He even defends his relationship to Eloise. It's just that neither of them, especially Madame Delacroix seemed that serious about him. So yeah, while there's no gay kissing or anything, there is an intriguing chemistry that he has with Henry. It's better than the chemistry that he has with Madame Delacroix, but you know, they were just flirting and having fun either way. So while Benedict didn't flirt and nothing happened between him and Henry, there was an obvious connection there. Also, did anybody notice this in season one that often Benedict had an actual bee on his collar? This is such a gorgeous detail and I was obsessed with it when I was rewatching. And oh my goodness, rewatching season one again was so much more fun than I remember. Remember that scene when Daphne and Simon agreed to pretend to court, the way they both walked into the town, the intense music, the way he tells her to look in his eyes, or that scene where the queen kisses her forward and tells her she's flawless. There was a duel in season one even. Oh my goodness, the drama. Lady Danbury's gambling nights for the married woman of the town, which kind of reminded me of Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette. And the way that the Duke removed Daphne's glove at their wedding. Oh my goodness. And then who could ever forget the Hastings ball in the end? They waltzed so beautifully on the checkered floor and then it started raining. Seeing Daphne's mother so happy for her, the gorgeous music, Daphne's pure joy, and the raindrops on the roses and the coupe champagne glasses. The cinematography in the scene is a fairy tale come to life. And I think about it often, actually. I could not get enough of it. Anyway, back to Ben. I don't feel strongly enough either way, whether they bring in Sophie or you know, maybe they could make his love interest be a legitimate son of an earl instead of a daughter. And he could be estranged from his family and end up in Benedict's country home as a footman type. I mean, who knows? The possibilities are endless. I just had a thought, you know who would be perfect for this? The guy who plays Ichabod Crane on the TV show Sleepy Hollow. I don't know, I can kind of see it. You know, while a gay pairing wouldn't be accepted realistically by the ton, as seen by Henry in season one and his lover, it would be a pretty interesting obstacle for them to overcome. He's also a Bridgerton after all, and his sister is a duchess. I'm pretty sure they can get away with it. I also think that we can suspend belief and have them live a happily ever after, even though they might not marry. I don't know, is a gay marriage in the 1800s any less believable than an African queen of England in the 1800s? No. And they pulled it off with Queen Charlotte, so I think that they can make it happen. I am curious, however, how they're going to handle Franny and John, because I gotta say, I'm not a fan of them doing more than one love story per season. Daphne and Simon, Canthony, they got so much screen time to develop their characters and the relationship. We, but we saw what happened with Penn and Colin in season three with so much going on. So I'm going to be hopeful going into season four. I'm going to have to keep an eye out on the developments. I do sometimes wish that they filmed seasons back to back though, so that we could at least get one year between seasons. Because two years is absurd. Like, what is this, Game of Thrones? No. Anyway, I can't wait for us to get a trailer, which of course I'm going to want to talk about. And uh, yeah, whatever you're thinking, feel free to share your thoughts. And thank you for watching.